how's it going guys? So a few years ago I made a static proxy scraper that could take proxies from very specific websites. Um, the code was unbelievably specific to the websites and I'm sure they've changed at this point so I doubt it even works anymore. Um, and it wasn't threaded and there was no, if I remember correctly, no proxy checker. So I figured today I would uh, upgrade that. I do like a walkthrough of upgrading that into a dynamic proxy scraper that could handle almost any website that holds a proxy list. And I would also include with it a proxy checker so that you could determine whether or not the proxies you were getting uh, were good or not. So uh, yeah, so with that being said, um, let's begin. So this is just a normal um, project. The only reason I didn't go through the whole file new project normal run through is because uh, on this computer I have to change the high DPI settings for all of my applications. Otherwise, they're super duper fuzzy. So I actually had to create the project and build it before making the video, or else every time I debugged, it would be unbelievably fuzzy and difficult to read, and the poor proportions would be off. And overall, it just wouldn't be a good experience. So um, yeah, that's the only reason that this is already a made project. Um, so, but yeah, otherwise it is a totally, um, blank form. So once you guys have your blank form up, I'm using Visual Studio 2017 in this video, uh, which you can get for free. You can get the community, community edition for free. So once you have everything set up and you're in a new project, uh, we can begin. So, um, the first thing we're going to need is a button and a, uh, geez, list view. There we go. Okay, so this should be enough to at least get us started. We'll be adding other buttons and menus and things as we go. Um, I kind of have a blueprint and some of the basic logic for how I want to do this, but um, a decent portion of the code is going to um, kind of be as we go. So forgive me if there are any um, unforeseeable problems that kind of come up. I'll do my best to debug them and um, yeah, we'll figure everything out as we go. Um, so I'm going to name this button to get IPs because this is what this button is going to be responsible for. We'll double click it to open up the sub procedure and we can begin with our first bit of code. So the first thing that we're going to need this application to do is reach out to whatever website that we're interested in and take all of the proxies off of it. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to need to import uh, system.net since we're going to be using a web client to accomplish this. And then we can do dim webc or declare webc as new web client. So this will allow us to access the internet um, from our application. And as a level of kind of cover, what we're going to do is we're going to add a user agent to our web client so that any uh, website that we are making requests to is going to uh, see us not as a uh, Visual Studio web client, but instead as a browser. Um, so I'm just going to be copying and pasting uh, what I already have for the user agent, but I'll, I'll put that in the description so that it's easy enough to copy and paste. And the source along with the application itself will be available um, in the description through download as well. Um, so yeah, so basically what we have so far is we have a web client named WebC and we've added a user agent in the form of a header to the web client in order to um, sort of mask our web client as a Firefox browser. Um, so the next thing that we'll need to do is actually get the source code of the website that we're interested in. So we can do dim source as string, which is equal to our webc dot download string. And we will be putting the website in right there. So let's go ahead and get that. So just as a test, we'll be using socksproxy.net. Um, so we can go ahead and copy that and put it in. Okay. So now what we've done so far is we have 
reached out to SoxFoxy.net and we have stored its uh, source code in a string called source. So the next thing that we'll need to do is we'll have to come up with a method to go through the source and find all of the IPs. So the uh, easiest way to do that is using regex. And so the first thing that we'll have to do before we start declaring our regex statement is we'll have to import uh, the system text dot regular expressions class in order to be able to access our regex class. So now that we have imported our system.text.regular expressions, we'll need to come up with a regex statement that will um, handle collecting all of our IPs for us from the source. So we will declare reg as a new regex object. And then um, we'll need to come up with a string that would represent the pattern we're looking for. So um, the easiest way to do this is going to be in brackets zero to nine, and that represents every um, integer between every single digit integer between zero and nine. So let's essentially imagine this as the first integer of an IP. We're essentially looking for that. And then we'll do a star question mark. And the star question mark represents that we're looking for the fewest number of these characters in a row that still matches our pattern. And then we will be doing a backslash period and so the backslash allows us to escape the period character because normally in regex, a period represents any character, but we don't want that. We want it to represent a literal period since that's what we will be looking for in the IP string. So by doing the backslash before it, we are escaping it and telling uh, our regex statement that we want it to be looking for an actual period. Um, so now that we have that done, we will be uh, just basically repeating the same line since, once again, we're looking for, uh, if you imagine an IP, 123.456, and then we'll need another point, and then uh, 789, and then, um, yeah, okay, and then once again, backslash period. And so it doesn't, um, if we do imagine this, 123.456.789, and then 0, 1, 2 at the end. Uh, if we were to look for the fewest number of characters here, so if we were just to repeat our code as is, it would only pull out uh, one character. It would only pull out the, um, like, like literally like the first character after the period. So instead, we're going to replace our star question mark with a plus sign. And this will, instead of looking for the fewest number of characters, look for the most. So with any luck, this will encompass the rest of the integers of the IP. And just by doing this pattern, we should be able to pick up any IP on any website. So now that we have our regex statement, uh, our, our pattern figured out, we will now create a match collection. So dim IPs is match collection, which is equal to reg.matches. So our match collection will, um, whoops, there we go. Um, so essentially our match collection will hold all of the matches. So every time that anything in our source string is matched by our regex pattern, it will now be, it's considered a match and it will be stored in our match collection. And then um, we will need to declare a new list. So we can do like dim IP list as new list of, whoops, of string. And we will be using that in one second. So now we will need to iterate through all of our IPs that we have in our match collection. So for each, we'll just call it match in IPs. And so this is essentially going to, in our match collection, we will be browsing, we'll be iterating through every single match. So one, two, three, four IPs, however many there are in our match collection, we'll be just focusing on each of them individually. And what we will do is we will add all of these to our um, IP list. So, 
Whoop, what? Match. My bad. That's weird. I lost focus for a second. Um, yeah, so for each match and IPs, we will be adding our match, and we have to declare it as a string since technically it is a considered a, a match um, in the uh, match collection. It's just kind of an object. So we will need to set it as a string in order to be stored in our list of string. Okay, so the next thing that we'll do is we will set our IP list to a, we'll essentially be removing the duplicates. So IP list is equal to IP list dot distinct dot to string dot to list. I'm sorry, um, I'm tripping over my words. I apologize. Um, so by doing this in case, uh, since the website might have duplicate IPs or you might match the same IP multiple times, since we don't know how many times it's technically stored on the website in order to avoid getting multiple duplicates of the same IP, we are, instead of just adding them directly, since all of these are going to be added to the list view, instead of directly adding them to the list view, as we go through them, instead, um, we will be adding them to this list of string, and then we will be clearing that list of any duplicates so that we're left with just individual IPs. And so the last thing we have to do is iterate through our IP list and add each item to our list view. Um, so for each item as string and IP list. So we're once again, just like we did earlier, iterating through, except this time we're iterating through our IP list that we declared up here. And we are declaring each um, object, each string in the IP list as uh, the variable item so that we can just refer to it as item. And now we will be uh, declaring a string array. So dim call one, uh, I'm just doing that for columns since we're gonna be adding these columns or rather rows to columns, but we need to keep track of which column it's going to be in. Um, so now we can add column zero is going to be equal to item and column one, we're just going to have equal to nothing. And then we can make a new list view item since we'll need to be converting the string array into a list view item so that it can be actually added to our list view. Um, so uh, I can't think of a variable name. LVI list view item, very clever, uh, as list view item. And then we'll set that to a new list view item and we'll have call as our uh, array. And then just as one more check, uh, mm, no, and in my practice, I said that I should use an if statement here, but I don't think I need to. So we'll have uh, list v one dot items dot add, and then we will be adding LVI um, into the um, list view since we've already cleared the duplicates. Um, so yeah, so this essentially from beginning to end should be um, sufficient to get us our IPs because we've declared our web client, we've downloaded the source of our website, we've set up a pattern to look for the IPs on the website, we've actually gotten the IPs, assuming they matched off of the website. We set up a list in order to hold all of our IPs. We've deleted all of the duplicate IPs. And then for each IP in our list, we are adding it to the list view. So um, very briefly, we do just need to set up our list view before we can test it. Since if we tried it right now, it would kind of just look like gobbledygook in the uh, list view. So we're going to do List view one, oops, not items, dot columns, dot add, and we'll just add IP, and we'll give it a width of 100, and we will add it a second column status 100. And now let's just make it look nice. List view one dot view is equal to view dot details. List view one dot grid lines is equal to true. And list view one dot full row select is equal to true. Okay, so that should do it there. So let's give this a try.
Okay, so let's get IPs. Nice, perfect. So yeah, there is our list of IPs. And as we keep going, we will um, build this into a system that can not only get IPs, but also determine the status working or not of each IP.